This is your first lecture on the religion of Christianity. After the Jewish people had a century of relative freedom, that being from around 165 BCE uh, to 63 BCE or BC, we then find that the Roman Emperor Pompey comes into Jerusalem and takes over the city. And so once again we find the Jewish people being under foreign control, imperial control. Uh, there are four uh, socio-political parties that you need to be aware of among the Jewish people the, pertaining to their response to this Roman occupation. And uh, this is very important for understanding the background at the time when Jesus of Nazareth would have been born. Uh, he was born sometime between the year 6 and 4 BCE or BC. Uh, first of all, we have two very conservative groups that hold the majority of the power. You see them pictured here in their religious court called the Sanhedrin. They're called the Sadducees and the Pharisees, uh, very similar to our Republicans and Democrats that uh, comprise Congress today. The Sanhedrin had these two uh, religious political parties that held all of the power. The Sadducees felt that the most important thing was that the people had the temple. And as long as the Jewish people had the temple, the Sadducees were so wealthy they were willing to pay whatever taxes Rome would demand because it really wouldn't hurt them in the pocketbook like it would the much poorer Jewish people. So the Sadducees again felt as long as they had the temple uh, then therefore they had God's presence with them and everything was just fine. The Pharisees were the other uh, very strong uh, religious political power in the Sanhedrin and rather than their focus being on the temple they felt it was much more important to have obedience to the law of Moses and you may remember back on one of the last lectures on Judaism we had the scribe or the priest named Ezra who pointed out that there were 613 of those laws. And so the Pharisees were experts in the law and they were interpreters of, of the law and we do find that Jesus comes in conflict with this group of people uh, quite a bit as well as the Sadducees. The Sadducees and Pharisees uh, are the ones that uh, Jesus will have the most conflicts with. Now one group that was far removed from society in Jerusalem were the Essenes. Uh, they stayed on the outskirts of town where there were uh, caverns and caves and the most important thing to this very conservative withdrawn group was to make sure that scripture would be preserved. And so the Essenes spent hour after hour each day just copying scripture over and over and over again and then they would put it in some sort of protective cistern and then they would hide that jar uh, somewhere in the caves and we still have archaeologists today who are discovering uh, new copies of scripture that were done by the Essenes some over 2,000 years ago. And then we uh, lastly have a very large group called the Zealots and many believe that most of Jesus' followers came from this group. Uh, the Zealots were the ones most opposed to Roman control because they could not afford this Roman occupation with the amount of taxes that were being taken from them. And so they are zealous uh, to take back Jerusalem as a Jewish city. And therefore, the zealots have a great deal of hope that the Messiah, this uh, promised warrior deliverer uh, that God uh, is going to send to them, will arrive at any time. And uh, there were many would-be messiahs during the time of Jesus. And of course, uh, Jesus' followers believe him to be the Messiah, although he will turn out to be a very different kind of Messiah than what they had hoped for. Remember, they, they hoped for a Messiah who would come with the sword to conquer Rome, and uh, Jesus, again, will end up being a very different kind of Messiah. The most important events for the Christian religion happen in a span of about 50 days, and uh, ironically, uh, it just so happens we're at the time of year, uh, that we're at the very beginning of that stretch of time. Uh, this is uh, what we refer to as Holy Week within the Christian tradition. And it begins on a day called Palm Sunday when Jesus comes into Jerusalem and is greeted as a conquering hero by the crowds there. Many have come to believe that he is the Messiah at this point. And the Pharisees and Sadducees are there in Jerusalem and they're very angry. And some of them are very afraid of Jesus and they are already scheming to bring about the end of Jesus' life on this Palm Sunday when all of the poor are lining the streets to welcome Jesus. Uh, we then see Jesus go through uh, days of giving his final teachings to those in Jerusalem on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And then on Thursday, Jesus makes the decision to celebrate the Jewish Passover with his disciples. And so uh, we have him securing a small apartment, an upper room, 
uh, where he takes uh, the uh, two of the elements used in a Passover Seder meal and he transforms their meaning and this becomes an extremely important Christian ritual or sacrament in which Jesus takes the bread and breaks it and says that the bread is now his body and he takes the cup of wine and blesses it and says that that is now uh, his blood and so the understanding is that as the disciples partake of that bread and that cup uh, they are therefore taking Jesus uh, into themselves. Uh, later that Thursday night Jesus is arrested. He is betrayed by one of his disciples named Judas and uh, he goes through a series of illegal trials throughout Thursday night and into the early uh, hours of Friday morning. And then at nine o'clock on Friday morning, Jesus is crucified. And uh, this is a common form of execution for criminals. Uh, Jesus, uh, as a matter of fact, was not even crucified alone. According to the stories within the uh, Christian religion, we have two other thieves who are uh, crucified on either side of Jesus. A typical uh, means of death here is by suffocation, that eventually uh, your muscles get so tired that you're no longer able to draw yourself up to take a breath, and so suffocation would be the primary way that one uh, would die. If a person lasted a very long time on uh, a cross, then sometimes just exposure to the elements would bring about uh, death. But Jesus does not last long on the cross. Uh, because uh, it is believed that he received some very severe beatings before being crucified. And the most common belief is that Jesus lasts approximately six hours, from about nine in the morning to three in the afternoon. Uh, we then have uh, Jesus being buried, which is quite unusual. We had two wealthy men secure permission to remove Jesus' body from the cross and have him uh, buried in a tomb. Uh, this was unusual because usually the common criminal, the body would just be allowed to decay and fall from the cross, and there were known to be ravenous dogs that would hang around the place of crucifixion uh, in order to uh, eat that which would fall from the cross. So definitely not a pleasant scene by any means at all. Uh, and then we have uh, the day called Holy Saturday in which, and this is surprising to many Christian people, but the belief is that on this Holy Saturday, Saturday that Jesus descends down to hell and frees those who are imprisoned in hell. And then on Sunday morning, we have the tomb where Jesus was placed is empty. The stone uh, that covered the tomb was rolled away. And uh, we have the belief that Jesus has been resurrected. This is not the same as resuscitation. Resuscitation is to bring someone back to life. Uh, resurrection was a very unique event to believe that someone is brought into an entirely new way of life. And this resurrected Jesus begins making several appearances uh, over the next 40 days. After these 40 days, we have Jesus giving his final directions to his disciples, telling them that they need to go throughout the world and continue his teachings. And then uh, Jesus ascends uh, into the sky, back into the heavens, where it is believed that he returns to the one that he called God the Father. Uh, one of the last things that Jesus tells his disciples is to make them a promise that uh, the Holy Spirit will be given to them. And so that event concludes this most important 50 days uh, for the Christian religion on the day of Pentecost, which is the Jewish celebration of the harvest. Uh, we have this event where the disciples are hiding in a small apartment in Jerusalem and an enormous wind, and then flames in the shape of tongues come down from the sky and fill the room, and the disciples pour out from that apartment into the streets of Jerusalem, and they begin telling the story of Jesus in all sorts of different languages, uh, languages that they had never been trained to learn, but suddenly this Holy Spirit gives them all of these different languages to speak to all of the different people who have come into Jerusalem for this celebration of the harvest. And so this is when the Christian uh, religion really begins to spread rapidly. Who were these very first uh, Christians? Well, first of all, they weren't called Christians. They were simply uh, known as members of the way. Uh, that's what the teachings and the life of Jesus were. Uh, uh, er the earliest name given to that was simply the way. And so that's
uh, what these very first Christians were called. Uh, eventually, there's a city to the north called Antioch, uh, to the north of Jerusalem, and it is there that uh, the people who spread the teachings of Jesus are called Little Christ or Christians. Uh, but the disciples who uh, had followed Jesus, that's what the term disciple means, one who follows Jesus, are now seen as apostles, which means a one who is sent. And so those who had followed are now those who are sent, and they become the earliest leaders of this church in Jerusalem. Uh, we do have, with very few exceptions, this first generation of Christians being Jewish people who had adopted the belief that Jesus was the Messiah they had been waiting for. It just turns out that he was a much different Messiah. Rather than conquering with the sword, he allowed himself to be uh, defeated. And through that defeat, through the death on the cross, these early Christians perceive a greater spiritual victory that comes from that. Uh, we do have some names we need to go over here. Uh, it seems that the chief among these disciples or apostles was a fellow named Peter. His name was, was actually Simon, and Jesus changed his name to Peter, which means the rock. And uh, Jesus on one occasion even told Peter that it was on him, the rock, that he would build his church. Uh, John is another one of the early disciples. He was probably the youngest of the disciples, and he appears to be the only one who lived to uh, old age uh, without being martyred. Uh, we have most of the disciples and early followers of Jesus are eventually arrested and they are executed. And that's what makes them a martyr. Um, Mary Magdalene, very important female disciple of Jesus. Uh, contrary to popular opinion, nowhere in the New Testament is she ever called a prostitute. A lot of people uh, make that uh, mistake of thinking that she is a prostitute. Uh, perhaps she was, but uh, nowhere in the story is it ever said that she is a prostitute. Uh, Stephen and Philip are significant as two of the very first deacons. Turns out these disciples become so busy uh, with the work that they need to do that they don't have time to take care of some of the needs of the poor and the widows, and so they create this office of the deacon, and the deacons will take care of those sorts of needs. An important thing to have down in your notes about Stephen is that he is believed to be the very first Christian martyr, uh, that he accuses a group of Jewish people leaving worship of being responsible for Jesus' death, and they become so angry at him for his accusations that they throw rocks at him until he has died. As a matter of fact, the story actually uses the euphemism of saying he falls asleep, and uh, so we have Stephen as our very first Christian martyr. Um, James is believed by many to be a brother of Jesus, a half-brother of Jesus, uh, because of the teaching of the virgin birth of Jesus. Um, James was also a very important leader of that early church in Jerusalem. And then perhaps most significant for making our transition to the next generation of Christian religion is a fellow named Paul, who never met Jesus and was actually uh, known as Saul of Tarsus and someone who sought to execute Christians. And he was on a trip to a place called Damascus where he heard there were Christians hiding out. And uh, while he is on his journey, he is knocked to the ground and blinded. And according to the story, the voice of Jesus comes from the heavens and asks Saul why he is persecuting uh, Jesus. And it's at that moment that Saul converts from being the Christian killer to becoming a very important Christian missionary. And uh, Paul becomes extremely significant in that he takes the Christian religion beyond the boundaries of Judaism. Because up until this time, Christianity had been understood as a small sect of rebellious Jews. But now Paul begins taking this story of Christ, the teachings of Christ. Uh, and actually, it's not so much the teachings of Christ as it is what Paul views as the significance of who Christ is. And he takes that message all over the Roman Empire and the Christian religion begins expanding as something beyond uh, Judaism at that point. Although there were some wealthy and educated Christians, the vast majority of Christians appear to be uh, the poor and the uneducated. And again, it was a heavily persecuted religion. And so um, the most common place of Christian worship was actually out in the cemetery or what they called the catacombs. And uh, the early Christians would go out there to worship very, very early on a Sunday morning before the sun had even uh, risen, and they would um, sing songs. There were hymns very early on in the Christian tradition 
be the offering of prayer, but the most important part of worship was the observance of communion or the Eucharist in which the bread and the cup would be taken. And there were some Christians who were very strongly tied into the Jewish tradition that continued to worship on Saturday rather than Sunday. Uh, some of the earliest holy days that were important, of course, the day of worship on Sunday because of the resurrection of Christ, except for those that remained true to the Sabbath tradition of Saturday. And then one Sunday a year would be recognized as the uh, celebration of Christ's resurrection, and that would be Easter. And uh, Easter was actually a replacement, eventually, of a pagan holy day. It would Later on, uh, and a few centuries later, it would become a replacement of the vernal equinox of uh, celebrating uh, the arrival of the season of spring. And then we also have no Christmas observed early on in the Christian calendar, but instead we have the day of January 6th celebrated as the day of Epiphany. And uh, that means uh, the, the appearance of a God has taken place in Jesus. And so uh, that's uh, really what is observed long before Christmas. Christmas will once again become a replacement of a pagan holy day. Uh, Pentecost, which was the rece uh, reception of the Holy Spirit, is a very early holy day. And then oftentimes, because Friday was the day of the crucifixion, we see that as a day of fasting and uh, meditation and prayer and preparation for the day of worship. Um, in addition to communion or Eucharist uh, being the highest act of worship, we have another very early practice called baptism within the church in which an individual who wished to be initiated into the church would either have water poured over their head or if there was enough water, they would be completely submerged uh, beneath the water. And uh, this would only happen on Easter Sunday, and most commonly they would have a three-year time of training and teaching of what it meant to be a Christian before the person would be baptized. Um, we have the worship service, again, typically taking place out in the cemetery, or if we have a wealthy Christian who has a home large enough, sometimes he uh, or she would host the other Christians as long as they're keeping a careful eye out. Uh, for the authorities, because again, in some areas, Christianity was not persecuted nearly as severely as it was in other areas. And again, uh, prayer, singing of hymns, uh, f hopefully someone would be wealthy enough to have a copy of Scripture, and so there would be readings from Scripture, and someone would make commentary on that, and then the people would come together for a, a common meal, and of course the highest act within that common meal, again, is the reception of communion or the Eucharist. For almost 300 years, the Roman Empire would view the Christian religion as a dangerous, revolutionary, rebellious movement against the empire. And so, uh, again, it, it would increase and decrease from time to time on how much persecution was taking place. But there were some times in which it was a very systematic, organized persecution in which church leaders would be rounded up and uh, they would be publicly martyred as a warning uh, to others to recant or go away uh, from this Christian religion, uh, this faith in Crestus. Um, pictured here is an early bishop who's a fine example of martyrdom for the Christian religion. This is Ignatius, it's a bishop of Antioch. And as they arrested him in Antioch, they began to, the Roman soldiers guarding him, make a long journey back to the capital of Rome because that's where they want his execution to take place so that everyone sees it and it will be a warning. But during his trip, there are other small churches that have banded together like militias and they send letters to Ignatius that they have a plan to break him out and free him. And Ignatius uh, responds to these plans by writing seven letters himself and all seven of his letters uh, give us insight into how martyrdom was seen as something uh, that would enhance one's reputation, even make one a saint in the Christian tradition. And so Ignatius in all of his letters says, no, do not. Uh, come to break me out. Uh, this is God's will for me to die for my faithfulness to Christ. And that's exactly what happened. And rather than it becoming a warning sign to Christians and scaring them, it becomes something that inspires other Christians as they see Ignatius now as a hero of the faith. Uh, one of the men who had planned to break Ignatius out became a bishop himself. His name was Polycarp. And Polycarp uh, gets to a very old age, uh, 86, before he is finally arrested. And as he is about to be executed, about to be martyred, 
Uh, the accusation made against him is that he is an atheist because he believes in an invisible God. Of course, many of the Romans have statues and pictures of their gods saying this is what the gods look like. And here you have one who worships an invisible God. And so the charge against him is that of atheism. And instead, right before he dies, Polycarp turns and points at all of his accusers and says, no, out with the atheist. You're the atheist, uh, not me, uh, because you do not believe in the God of Jesus Christ. And so he takes that charge of atheism and turns it against them. But it fortunately, uh, unfortunately does not uh, turn out any better for Polycarp. He is also martyred uh, because of his uh, faithfulness to the Christian religion. Another important element that we see developing in early Christianity is the apologist tradition. Uh, pictured here is yet another martyr, Justin Martyr. And rather than seeing philosophy and the teachings of other religions as something that's antithetical to the Christian religion, we have Justin making the argument that all other philosophies are attempting to get close to the ultimate truth or the absolute truth that you see within the Christian religion. And uh, this is what we mean by apologist, not making an apology in the sense of saying you're sorry about something, but an apology is a defense of one's own philosophical or religious positions. And so Justin is the finest representative of an early Christian apologist, one who defends the teachings of the Christian faith. And uh, one of his primary teachings was that all truth belongs to God. So whether you find it in Moses or whether you find it in Plato, whether you find it in Cicero, uh, all of that is truth. But again, it's all truth that is partial truth and the absolute or ultimate truth is found in Christianity. And so this is a, a different view that we have developing, and it, it's one that is still uh, parts of modern day Christianity, of seeing other teachings not so much as against Christianity, but partial truth rather than the whole truth of Christianity. And, and Justin, again, a very early example uh, representing that opinion. And then things change dramatically when we come to the early 4th century of the Common Era. The Roman Empire had become so large that it wasn't believed that a single emperor could rule over the entire empire. So the empire was first divided in half, and then it was divided again in half. And so we have four emperors that are all regional emperors. But eventually we have one of these regional emperors growing so strong that he decides he wants to bring the entire empire together under his sole control. His name is Constantine. And Constantine goes on a variety of military campaigns and eventually does uh, take one of the other regions of the empire. And then he takes yet another. So there's only one that's now out of his control. And the night before he is to go into battle against this rival uh, emperor Licinius, he receives a vision in which he is instructed to place a symbol called the labarum on the shields and helmets of his soldiers. Now, what is significant about this symbol called the labarum? It consists of two Greek letters, the chi or the ki, and the letter rho. And chi and rho uh, was a very common Christian symbol because it's the first two letters and the term Christ. And so here we have this pagan emperor going into battle with this Christian symbol, and it is Constantine, strangely, who uh, now is not so much converting to the Christian religion, but certainly accepting it as a religion alongside the other Roman religions. And so now, after all of these centuries, almost 300 years of persecution, which it was extremely dangerous to be a Christian, now it's an officially sanctioned religion of the empire. Now this date is not on the slide, but please get it down in your notes. In the year 313 of the Common Era, or AD, we do have the signing of an edict called the Edict of Milan. And the Edict of Milan in 313 is seen as the official formal ending of imperial persecution of the Christian faith. Now this does not make anything better for Jewish people because one of the uh, primary prejudices, biases that develops as the Christian religion continues to grow is that Jewish people are responsible for 
for killing uh, Jesus. And so, therefore, we continue to have Jewish persecution, anti-Semitism throughout the unfolding centuries. But this is the end of Christian persecution as it becomes an officially recognized religion of the Roman Empire. And again, Constantine is hardly what we would call an Orthodox Christian because he continues to worship the other uh, Roman gods alongside worshiping Christ. As a matter of fact, he refuses to be baptized until he is on his deathbed because one of the most common beliefs of Christians during this time was that after you were baptized, you were only allowed one more sin, one post-baptismal sin. And if you had more than one sin after you were baptized, then you would lose your salvation. And uh, Constantine is one who had adopted that belief, and so he waited until he was on his deathbed to be baptized. This officially sanctioned acceptance of Christianity makes the Christian religion look very different than it had ever looked before. Rather than small groups that are fearing persecution, gathering in a small home or at the cemetery early in the morning, we now have these enormous structures, these sanctuaries that are built where everyone comes together to worship. And rather than the stress being on a local community with local leaders, we start to have a hierarchical system of uh, archbishops and bishops and the bishops over a group of priests and eventually the development will come about of the bishop over all bishops who will be the pope in the western tradition of Christianity. Well there are many people that were uh, not at all happy about this change in Christianity. Uh, they felt that it should continue to be a very tough and demanding faith and so we do have the development against Constantinian Christianity that is a monastic form of Christian, uh, of the Christian religion. And we see this monastic reaction come about in two major approaches. One would be an individual monk would move out into the desert or out into the wilderness where he would rely on individuals coming to visit him to bring him food, but his life would be spent in meditation and prayer and fasting. Uh, pictured here is one of our earliest examples, if not the earliest example, of an ascetic Christian monk. This is Saint Anthony. Okay, Saint Anthony is uh, sometimes referred to as an anchorite desert monk. Okay, one who had moved out into the wilderness and he waits uh, for uh, friends and followers to come find him in the desert to bring him just a little morsel of food uh, when it's not during a time of fasting. But again, this is the ascetic tradition where you are completely alone as an isolated individual practicing this form of monasticism. The other tradition is called the Cenobitic tradition. And the Cenobitic tradition would be a group of men and eventually a group of women, but never men and women together, but a group of men, monks, or a group of women, nuns, who would voluntarily form a self-sufficient community uh, where they would have a small garden uh, and then uh, you would have some people responsible for growing the crops. You would have others responsible for cooking the meals. Uh, you would have uh, worship where you would come together every day in some monastic forms up to nine times a day you would be required to come together for some sort of worship and it was a commitment to living as simply uh, as possible but rather than living completely alone uh, living in a community and our first uh, best example of this is a fellow named Pacomius and one thing to know about the Pacomian style monastery is you could not just go there one day and sign up and say I want to be a part of this you would actually have to stand outside of the gate and uh, you would have to show how dedicated you were until they decided within the monastery to open the gates and welcome you in as part of the community uh, just as a quick aside here if any of you have ever seen the movie Fight Club which is one of my favorites uh, you notice that the, they set up a Pacomian style community and uh, this is uh, that part of the movie if you've seen it is copied from this uh, early form of monasticism of one having to stand outside the doors of the home in the movie Fight Club until Tyler Durden, uh, the leader of the group, decides to let you in to be part of the community. Uh, co coincidentally, uh, many of these who came to join the Pacomian style monastery were not even Christians. They had not heard the Christian story. They were simply attracted to this simple idea of living in a self-sufficient community and it's only after they came into the community that they would hear the Christian story and convert and be baptized. 